um, what was happening, that what I meant by raise your voice is speak up. Know that you have something valuable to say. Um, know that your experience, your unique voice, your unique perspective matters and speak it. Um, and I, I wanted to ask this question. What are ways we can raise our voices? And does raising our voice always include words? And as you're thinking about that, I'm gonna stop the share and I want to put you in breakout rooms um, so that you can talk with other people. You're like, are there other ways to raise your voice that don't include words? And what are ways, what are ways you can raise your voice? And what are ways that don't include words? Um, both of those questions. Um, let me put you into um, seven, eight breakout groups and um, introduce yourself and where you're having school, you know, like where you're in school, um, from San Diego State, from your home in La Mesa, from your home in uh, the Bay Area, wherever you are, just introduce yourself and where you're in school. And then address the questions. And then I'll bring you back in and we'll talk about it together. So there you go. Alexa, Alexa, set timer for three minutes. Okay. Alexa, stop timer. Hi. 
Hi, Alan. Yeah. Is your name Alan? Uh, it's my middle name. My first name is Carlos. Okay. Because um, I was so confused. I take attendance when you all oh. are hidden in your breakout rooms. And I, and I said, I don't have an Alan on my roster. I was so confused. So do you go by Alan, Carlos? I usually go by my first name, but my email has my middle name. And for some reason, the school email just decided to put me as Alan F. So, um, okay, you know you can change your name. It's um, fine. Anyway. It's, yeah, it, it, yeah. Well, most of the, you know, like I, I, I'll remember for next time, but you can change your name if you're ever on a Zoom room so that people know your name. All right. So, uh, but it's your call. It's your call. Um, but thank you for, um, yeah, for clarifying that with me. So, so group one. Um, I know, don't you love being group one? Because, But I won't always call on group one. Um, what are ways that you can raise your voice? Some of the ways we were talking about um, involve like activism, like um, volunteering or protesting, like ways that you can kind of express what you believe in or stand up for things. Yeah, thank you, Amaru. Um, what are other ways you can raise your voice? Group two. Uh, similar to group one, we were talking about how like the protests that are going on in the US, how people instead of like saying what they want, they would go out and act upon it and do what they want, as well as using social media as an outlet as well, just to spread like maybe like infographics with like graphs and charts, like this is the problem that we need to address. And here are ways that we can deal with it. Yeah. Group three, did you come up with anything different? Uh, we talked about how you can raise your voice through art and music and how it takes self-confidence to and confidence in what you have to say to be able to raise your voice in any sort of way. Um, I, I, I saw that, um, I was watching um, United, is it called United We? United We Fall with um, Kamau Bell and last night, and he was interviewing um, people from uh, in the US from Iran, and he interviewed um, a, an Iranian artist who creates the most beautiful drawings and they're so subtle and there'd be like a bullet inside of a high heeled shoe. And it was, it was wild and crazy. And she, what she said is, you know, like I can, I, you know, like somebody, I can put hidden messages in here, subliminal messages, things people can see. Um, but if they call me on it, I can go, oh, that's not what I meant. And so it was really subversive, almost secret, the way she could weave in messages. Um, can any of you think of um, musicians or artists who are particularly adept at, um, communicating uh, through, um, without words. Um, I know of one artist who, a lot of it is through words, but Madame Gandhi is kind of this new modern artist. And um, she focuses a lot more on like um, feminism and that kind of movement and like supporting her voice in like electronica and more like party type music and rap. Cause it's more like very like, misogynistic aspects are very embedded into that type of music. So she's um, like creates her own music, but from the feminist perspective, so there's something out there that um, amplifies that voice in rap. Um, yeah, uh, we're gonna be looking at some um, texts coming up, um, texts that are, their personal essays that which is not like the essays you've been writing in high school or most of the essays that you've been writing that you will write in college but personal essays that challenge people using words and verbal images to raise their voices and um, challenge people to change and and i think that that's where we're going this semester is sometimes um sometimes 
marching in protest, that group of people all together um, standing unified, that can be really powerful um, in drawing attention to the needs for change. Um, public speaking can do that. Art and music can do those things. Um, writing an op-ed can do that. Um, writing a letter to um, a newspaper or the Daily Aztec. Um, those are ways that we can um, raise our voices. Um, speaking up in a personal conversation where somebody says something that you say, no, no. Um, let me get back to the PowerPoint because our, there are several things that I want to talk about um, today, and I don't want to run out of time. Um, this is our agenda for today. Um, I want to discuss elements of rhetoric, and then I want to then look at Ben Rafus, Why Visit Your Campus Writing Center, and then I want to introduce the next text. So let's uh, go ahead. Um, why is it hard to say what we think? Um, I asked you to think about that in the reflection direction question for last week. Um, Kathy Kang, who I quoted her in the syllabus, and I'll probably quote her again. She said she was raised with these ideas, this, I, this English proverb, children are to be seen and not heard. Um, she was influenced by the Japanese proverb, the nail that sticks out gets hammered. And she was, um, by the way, that should not say proverbs, it should say proverbs. But that's because um, I was typing too quickly. Um, she was influenced by this um, verse from Proverbs, even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. She was raised to be quiet, not to speak up, not to contradict the people around her, not to speak back against authority. And some of us, I know I was raised the same way. Um, and I know some of you were too. I also tend to be an introvert, and I know some of you are too. Um, I was afraid that I would sound uninformed or stupid or that people would be angry with me if they disagreed with me. And I know that some of you, that's how you feel. Um, but I also know others of you said, no, I don't have any problem. And so, and, and even then you said, um, and I don't remember which of you said this, but sometimes it's just better not to say anything because it won't make any difference. And so in thinking about what we're going to say, how we can say it, um, what are the best strategies, that brings us to rhetoric. Aristotle says the Rhetoric is the ability to determine the available means of persuasion. Weaver says it moves the soul with a movement which cannot be finally justified logically. Burke goes a little dark and he says it's the manipulation of minds for political ends. And E. Shelley Reed, who you read this weekend, um, said rhetoric is when we're writing about something we care about, showing and not just telling, and paying attention to the needs of the author and the audience than the teacher. She says, when we write this way, we write rhetorically. And I think that this aligns with what you were talking about when I asked you, when do you feel motivated? It's when you are interested, when you care, um, when you know what you're talking about and you're most effective when you're showing and not just telling and you are focused on what you need to get across and who you should share that with and teachers don't enter into it all when you really have something to say and my goal this semester is to give you things that actually need to be said that you feel passionate about um, 
Another thing about rhetoric you should keep in mind, and I think Reed alludes to this because she's constantly talking about the audience, the audience, the audience. Um, rhetorical styles change depending on who you are speaking to. Um, I quoted for some of you, I quoted um, bell hooks and in writing or teaching to transgress, that's what she says, is that when we are speaking, we are continually thinking about who we're talking to and we're adapting to reach that audience. And that brings up this concept that I mentioned last week, which is underlying assumptions. Um, we can view underlying assumptions as beliefs that an audience assumes that the, the beliefs that an author assumes an audience has even before they start speak, writing. So I might assume, well, let's not go with me. Let's go with Reed. Reed assumes her audience finds writing difficult, at least sometimes. She assumes that they would like to be, her audience would like to be better writers. So that, and she assumes that they may have been discouraged at some point in the past. And so she writes from that vantage point. Um, so it's not a claim she's making, she just says writing is hard and she assumes that her audience already thinks that. She offers no evidence that it's hard. Um, she just assumes that her audience thinks that. So other ways of looking at under, other underlying assumptions might be um, worldview, um, givens, ideas or facts that we take for granted, things we think assumed to be true, beliefs, things that are accepted, or values, a person's principles or standards of behavior. How do we know, how do we find what those assumptions are, those underlying assumptions? Sometimes we can just get a feel for it, um, but other times um, we have to support, um, other times, well, I'm, it's so hard to talk when I'm not looking at students. And so, so I'm, I feel like I'm off my game talking about things that I know about like the back of my hand to a screen. So how do we know what underlying assumptions are? Because if we want to appeal to an audience, if we want to connect to them in ways that help us build our own ethos, then we have to figure out what that audience already thinks um, and appeal to them. If you want to identify that in a text that you are analyzing, you might look for phrases. Um, I believe, if you believe, no, in my opinion, most people think, must, should, statements related to right or wrong, strong nouns or verbs, claims made without support. Um, those are the ways that you're looking at finding the underlying assumptions. So, I'm going to stop this share and actually look at your faces because, um, this is a weird concept. Um, a lot of students are taught to write for a general audience. And it seems like that general audience often just is the teacher. And so you're just writing as if everybody knows everything, but really it's the teacher who assumes things. Ben Rafith is not writing for a general audience. He's writing for a really specific audience. Who is that audience that he's writing to? Um, David, who is Ben Rafeth in Why Visit Your Campus Writing Center? Who is he writing to? Um, I, unmute yourself. 
I know. I forget all the time. Yeah, sorry about that. I that is that. okay. Um, well, obviously, I think he's writing to college students when he talks about campus center. Mm -hmm. Right away, when he says campus writing center, I'm thinking about a college campus. Yeah, definitely. And so I can tell from the title alone, I get an idea of what his audience is. Great point. Um, is there anything that uh, any of you note that he assumes his audience thinks? Mm, that he assumes that the people reading it haven't gone to writing centers and like aren't really on board with the idea of going? Yeah, how do you know that, Kristen? Well, if I was already going, he wouldn't have to like convince me to go because I would already be going. He wouldn't need any reason to tell me to. Um, it, good, good point. Is there anything else that he assumes his audience thinks? Mm. Maybe assuming that writing is hard or that writing needs to be looked at by other people? Um, this idea that writing needs to be looked at by other people, that's probably his claim that he's making, but he assumes his audience thinks that writing is difficult. Um, here's what I'd like you to do. I'm gonna put you back in these breakout groups very, very briefly. And I want you to look for things that he assumes that they think. If he's using phrases, if he's making claims without support, like his very first sentence is an example of this. He says, there's something about the experience of speaking with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, the facial expressions, the enunciations, gestures that make us feel alive and energized. So here he's making a, phrase, a claim in his very first sentence. What is he assuming his audience thinks? Andy? Um, so I wrote down that he ha he assumes that the students are coming in with assumptions themselves about writing centers or assumptions about their own skills of writing that maybe they think that they can do it all by themselves or they they only need to have like one set of eyes look at it, which is their own or he assumes that students are scared or they're not confident enough to go to a writing center. Yeah, how did you know those things, Andy? Um, just from, I guess, from the things that he says, I know that there's a whole section, one of his, um, like, subheads is that students are not confident, and that's one of the things that, the, that writing centers can help with. Yeah. And he also says in the first paragraph something about, or I think in the first page somewhere, something about them doing it by themselves, or, I'm pretty sure, I don't know exactly where the quote is, but. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I'm glad that you're thinking about how do I, how do I identify those things from a line or a phrase in the text? Because if you're writing an essay, you can say he assumes these things. Um, if I ever ask you to identify underlying assumptions, and I definitely will. Um, it's easy to say it, you know, like you get a feel for it. But if you're writing an academic essay, you have to be able to justify that conclusion. You have to say, I see this in the text, and th therefore I can draw this conclusion. So I want to go back to the fir very first sentence of this text, where he says, there's something about the experience of speaking with someone that makes us feel alive and energized. And what is he assuming? You know, like that sentence is he's making an assumption about what his audience thinks. What is that assumption that he's, you know, like he's saying, I assume my readers think X. My readers of probably first year college students think X. Um, I think that he's assuming that people enjoy conversation more than writing and they value talking to people more than they value what's actually on paper. 
Yeah, I think that that's a really good conclusion, Mari, that, um, that they actually enjoy conversations, that conversations aren't terribly threatening, um, at least some of the time. Yeah, um, and so he opens with this appealing to this assumption. Why open appealing to an assumption? Like straight off the bat. Um, Jenna, why open with an assumption like that? I think that way it like kind of sets up the whole paper. That way like people will know what he's going to be talking about and like what you're going to get from reading this. Yeah, I think that that's part of it. Can somebody add an, another reason to what Jenna said? Anna, maybe you? Uh, it could be that he's trying to um, appeal to people who think this. And so he's like, if you like this, then like that's, you're similar to me in that sense. And so we're going to have things that we can agree on in this paper. Kind of yeah. like building on yeah, that ability to connect with an audience straight up in the very first sentence is really, really powerful um, in aligning ideas. Um, e. Shelley Reed did that in the very first sentence of her article. You know, like you're thinking, oh no, we have to read this article about writing. I don't want to, I've read so many articles about writing. I never want to read another one. Can they possibly say anything new? And quite honestly, Reed didn't say anything you didn't already know. And, um, but she said it differently. And she overcame those barriers by starting out with that very first sentence, writing is hard. Straight up, she says that. And so by appealing to that assumption that most people think writing is hard, she can overcome those barriers. Um, let me go back to the PowerPoint. And I want to, um, um, here we are. These are words that you've seen before, somewhere along the line. Um, ethos, pathos, and logos. And you've probably been told ethos is an ethical argument. Pathos has to do with emotions and logos has to do with logic or evidence. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide and go right into this. Ethos is an ethical argument, if that's what you've been told, in the sense that we are more likely to trust people we think are ethical. So what Aristotle meant is that when a person constructs ethos, a writer or a speaker constructs ethos, they're building their trustworthiness. And he observed that we're more likely to trust people who seem knowledgeable, who seem to share values or experiences with the audience, who seem concerned for the audience, who seem fair or objective, or who just seem good. And so if you're thinking about um, how um, Rafeth is building ethos or seeming trustworthy, we can see that he sh seems very knowledgeable and he really does seem to understand what students think about. Um, and he seems concerned for them, for their success. And that kind of thing is really, really important in a text, that building that trustworthiness. Um, pathos is when, not just when an author talks about an emotion, but when an author or a speaker gets the audience to feel the emotion. Because we're more likely, Aristotle says, to persuade somebody if we can get them to feel an emotion. And sometimes students say, well, that's pathos. Or if you've heard pathos, um, either way, they're not, they're Greek words that I don't actually know. 
except I know how to use them. Um, you might think of sadness or anger as emotions, but there are a whole range of emotions. Curiosity is an emotion. Um, empathy is an emotion. Intrigue or interest is emotion. Uh, disgust is an emotion. I mean, there are subtle emotions that we feel. Boredom is an emotion, not necessarily one that you want to get your audience to feel, but it is an emotion. And evidence is not the same as logos, because you can put all the evidence in to a text and still not be building logos. And Reed talks about this. She talks about the jello, balancing um, evidence and arguments. I mean, like you've got to have the evidence, but if you just pile in cherries, 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 people are going, what do I do with that? And that's why it's more important to think about logos as logic or reasoning to make an argument seem true. It's like you want your audience to say, aha. Am I done? Yeah, aha. And, and that is when they go, oh, that totally makes sense. Definitely evidence helps, but evidence alone isn't going to make that work. So, questions for me about ethos, pathos, and logos, or underlying assumptions? I do have a, a quick question. Yeah, Derek. Um, could you say that um, it's the commonality between Reed and Rafith is that they had a, um, a hook that introduced their credibility statement? Um, yeah, um, I think that that's a great observation. Um, they built rapport with the audience immediately. And building rapport with an audience immediately is a great way to begin constructing ethos. Um, if you'll notice, both Rafith and Reed are constructing ethos from the very beginning of their very first sentence all the way to the end. They never stop. Why is that valuable? Anybody? It kind of keeps the audience hooked. Like you like keep reading and you're like, oh, I can relate to this. Uh, yeah. Um, building that rapport constantly is, um, it keeps your reader with you. And I think that that's really, really valuable. Um, those ethos appeals are continual in both of these texts. Um, other observations? I think that it's also probably just the power of repetition. Just if you have it throughout the essay and your reader sees you being credible and knowledgeable about the subject just multiple times, it just really hammers the point home. Yeah, um, repetition is not necessarily a bad thing, despite what we've been told. Um, let me ask you a question about Reed. Um, Reed talks about not necessarily writing to the rules. Does that mean rules don't count? What does she mean? Anybody? I mean, not like completely stick with the rules. Like don't, uh, like it's okay to sometimes bend the rules. Yeah, definitely she's talking about why it's okay to sometimes to bend rules. Um, what else might she mean? Uh, Yeah, Anna? Or Grace? I don't know who was going to speak. I thought uh, she was talking a bit about uh, how um, that if you are only writing to a list of rules, then your writing's going to seem very rigid and not like a fluid piece of work. And so, and it makes writing a lot harder when you only focus on 
the don'ts of like you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do this if you focus on the principles that she gave instead then writing becomes a little bit easier yeah again she's assuming that her audience has um experienced that that block of you know i don't know I, I, the rules are too hard grace did you have something else you wanted to add to that No, no. No, sorry, I'm just like my computer. I can't do anything. Oh gosh, that's so horrible. I'm sorry. I, one of the things that I think the read wants to emphasize um, is an idea that Michaela brought up last week, that there's no single style of writing. There's no single type of writing. There's no one right way to write. And I think that that's important to remember because rules change. You might have been taught never to use fragments, but fragments can be powerful ways of emphasizing ideas. You might have been taught never to use I in an essay. And in some essays, that wouldn't work. But in some essays, the use of I is really valuable. I mean, imagine if Reed isn't using I or you, because she uses those really powerfully to connect with her audience. And you've probably been told, don't do that. And so here's this idea, is you as an author, you have a purpose, and you have an audience, and it's a distinct audience, and you want to figure out how do you connect to that audience, how do you achieve your purpose in the best of all possible ways, how do you connect with them, how do you build rapport with this particular audience, so that you can achieve your purpose, so that you can raise your voice on something that's absolutely important to you. And I think that this is her idea of rules. Sometimes, definitely, Connor's point is true. Um, we can bend the rules a little bit. Sometimes the rules just shift. Sometimes they're just different. And we have to be able to recognize what does our audience expect? I want to finish up. We have about five minutes left. And let me go back to share screen. And I want to introduce the text that you're going to be reading next. And it is this one. Um, it's titled um, Joyous Survival, the Literacy of the Hillside Strangler and Anything Extra We Know. And I want to walk you through a little exercise. By the way, Callie Linfor is a lecturer here in the RWS department at SDSU. And she actually works in the office right across from me. And when I moved into that office, um, she was there and I introduced her, myself to her because I thought, I'm going to be in this office. Um, I should know the people around me. And we had never met. And um, She's one of my best friends now, and she's been teaching a lot longer than I have. So I ask her for information all the time. And I asked her for a text. I told her I was going to be teaching on literacy. This was a few years ago. And she goes, oh, I have an essay that I wrote some years ago um, for the San Diego Area Writing Project. And she gave it to me, and I go, oh my gosh, this is so dark. Um, and then I been teaching it ever since then. So that's many pictures of Callie. Callie teaching, Callie posing, and Callie as a five-year-old. So, um, so a little bit about her. Um, her audience is the San Diego Area Writing Project. It's a program um, at UCSD that writing instructors go to over the summer um, to learn to write to teach writing in a more appealing way. 
And um, so she is writing, her audience is not you. Reed and uh, Rafeth were both writing to you. Reed is not writing to you. She's writing to um, writing teachers, okay? I know you're going, that is a strange title for, um, that is a strange title for a, a writing thing. She's answering um, the question, what does literacy mean to me? So uh, what, think about writing teachers. What do you assume writing teachers believe about literacy? Anybody? Um, well, they because or if they're teachers of literacy and of English, then they probably assume or they probably believe that everyone should like have a somewhat basic knowledge of reading and writing and analyzing. So they probably find value in that and they believe that everyone should know a little bit about that. At least. Yeah, good point, Andy. They think that literacy, reading and writing are absolutely important. Um, and so she is writing to people who believe that. Now she's got this really funky title, um, Joyous Survival, The Literacy of the Hillside Strangler and Anything Else Extra We Know. And that's a little subversive because seriously, is the Hillside Strangler, is there a literacy related to the Hillside Strangler? Um, what surprises you about this title. Or what do you expect to read about with this title? Uh, just looking at it. So with like the joyous survival and then the pairing of the hillside strangler it kind of makes it seem like there's like a villain being the strangler who might be an actual person. And with the inclusion of joyous survival, it makes it seem like she's had a experience with the strangler. So it's kind of shows that it might be from a viewpoint of her own while she's writing about this being. Tuan, while you're here, I wanna ask you another question. And she pairs it not with, you know, like the hillside strangler, but it's the mm -hmm. literacy of the hillside strangler. Yeah. What do you think that means? So it sounds cheesy, but you know, in like those, how do I say it? The, uh, the, well, like the ransom notes or letters that you would get from these bad people per se with like the magazine letters. So you don't like read their handwriting, but you can still pick up how they write what, right? So I was like, kind of like thinking it's like, oh, maybe they have like a specific way of writing or like kind of getting their meaning across through that modem. Wow, I would not have thought of that, but I like that idea. I like that idea. That's not where it goes, but 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 it's a but you know what? I like that it made you think of that because it made you think. And I think that she's got this title in order to make you think. You know, like what is that juxtaposition? You're absolutely right. There is joy survival. This is a happy ending. Um, and it is also, she survived something, something that was potentially dangerous. Um, titles for an essay like this, titles are there to intrigue. Titles are there to make you think of something. If it's those crazy newspaper um, notes, um, ransom notes, or something. So you're going to be reading this um, we'll talk about it on Wednesday, and yeah, we're out. It's 11.50. Um, I will talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Um, I'll stick around wait. if you've got questions. Otherwise, you can go. It's 11.50. Wait, just to the group. I, I made a group meet, and I'm linking it. So if you want to join the group meet, and I don't know. Yeah, just I put it in the chat if anyone wants to join. Sorry, I didn't mean to catch you off or anything. Oh, no. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for doing that. Okay.
I'll stick around for a little bit longer if anybody wants to ask me questions. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Zachary, Derek, questions for me? Okay. We're all set. Thanks.